So here are the notes for chapter six, section two. This one will just go over um, covalent bonding and then I'll make a separate movie over the actual Lewis structures. So this is just for covalent bonding and the other videos for specifically Lewis structures. So first of all, how does a covalent bond form? Well, you have to have, get my pen going here. Um, <clears throat> first of all, you have to have the elements notice each other. See here, they're too far apart for them to even notice each other. So this is what's considered to be like a baseline energy of the unbonded atoms. In this case, we're just bonding two hydrogen atoms, but it could be two of any atom. And then as they get close enough to actually notice each other, immediately there starts to be an increase in stability or a decrease in energy between the two atoms. And then they get closer, 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 closer until you reach this magic distance between the two atoms where they have lost the most amount of energy that they can uh, they're at their most stable point, and if you tried to cram them any closer together, it would take a lot of energy to do that. So the distance, or the difference between the standard energy state and this energy amount right here, see this y-axis is energy, um, this difference is your bond energy, and this guy down here at the bottom is your actual bond length. This is that magic distance where they are at their most stable point of sharing the electrons. Uh, so just to show you this is kind of another way of saying the same thing. And this applies to any bond, not just a covalent bond, but that it's a balance of attractive and repulsive forces. The attractive forces between the electron cloud and the nucleus of another atom and the electron cloud of this guy and the nucleus of the first atom. Remember, the opposites attract and then likes repel. So the electron clouds of each atom are going to repel each other, and then the positively charged nuclei are going to repel each other. And so when you reach this magical balance of attraction and repulsion, that's where you have a bond. In this case, we're talking about covalent bonds. And just FYI, the definition of bond length, that's the distance between two covalently bonded atoms. So... To actually have what's classified as a bond, then you have to find this magical distance where the repulsion and the attraction forces are equal, but they're opposite in direction. Because you can think of a repulsion as like a push and an attraction as a pull. And potential energy is at its lowest point, so that, that potential energy curve that graph that we saw two slides ago, you're at the bottom of that curve. That's when you're at your most stable. And of course, nature favors stability. Um, nature favors low energy states because they're easier to keep track of. They're easier to, to balance, I guess. I don't know if that's the right word. So um, when an atom forms a bond, they become more stable. And that energy difference, you know, back here we had The energy difference right here, the difference between here and here, that's the bond energy. And this energy has to be, it has to go somewhere, it can't just be destroyed. And so what happens is it gets released off into the environment as heat or maybe light, sometimes sound, or possibly a combination of all three. The stronger the bond is, the more energy that's going to be released and the more heat, light, and sound you will get from that release. So coming back to where we were. Um, so they're going to release that energy. If you want to break that bond, then that same amount of energy that was released has to be absorbed. And so we call that the bond energy. The higher the bond energy, the stronger the bond. So the more energy that gets released, the stronger the bond is or the more energy that has to be put in to break the bond, the stronger the bond is. So looking at this table right here, you don't have to write this table down, but I just want to say, do you see a trend between bond length and bond energy? And if you notice, you can just look over at pauses and then come back. 154 is the strongest or the longest bond length we have, and it's one of the weakest. Then as the bond gets shorter, the energy goes up gets even shorter, energy goes up even more. As bond length increases, that causes bond energy 
to go down or vice versa. You could say as bond length gets shorter, the bond energy goes up. And then if you compare that to your bond types, you'll notice that the longest bonds are your single bonds and your shortest and strongest bonds are your triple bonds. And this is where I threw in that analogy of, well, this is a married couple, you know, their bond is decently strong, you know, they're, they're close and they have, you know, slightly strong bond, but you throw a kid into the mix and now you have not only their marriage keeping them together, but you have a kid keeping them together. So they get a little bit closer. The bond gets a little bit stronger. Then you throw another kid into the mix and now you have not only the marriage keeping you together, you've got the first kid keeping you together, now you got the second kid keeping you together. You become even closer and your bond is even stronger. So that's kind of one way to think about it. So what determines, you know, why if we're looking at this, why don't all elements just automatically strive for this massively strong triple bond um, for all of their elements. Well, the problem is, is that some elements just can't do that. You know, the ultimate goal of an atom is to look like a noble gas, electron speaking, you know, to have the eight electrons. That's why we call it the octet rule. Um, and so an atom is going to either gain or lose, and this is an ionic bond, or it can share, and that's what we're talking about here with the covalent bonds the electrons that it appears to have, or maybe actually does have, eight electrons in its outer energy level. There's some great pictures on page 169 if you want to check those out. Um, and so we're specifically focusing on the sharing today, but it doesn't matter. You know, every element wants to satisfy the octet rule, except for the exceptions, because of course if we have a rule, then we have to have exceptions. Hydrogen, its closest noble gas is helium. And helium has two electrons, so hydrogen is happy with two electrons. And in actuality, because hydrogen is a 1s element, it only has room for two electrons. This is, you know, that, that person that lives in the loft in downtown Dallas, they don't have room for company. Uh, hydrogen just doesn't have room for company, so it can only hold two electrons. Boron is really strange in that it can only have six electrons. And I'll admit, I've never really, never tried to understand why boron only needs six electrons, but it does. Um, and then sulfur and phosphorus and really any 3P and beyond, so 3P, 4P, 5P, 6P, 7P, you know, when we find 7P electrons, they can actually, they're capable of holding more than eight electrons. And um, this makes sense because if you have a third or fourth or fifth or sixth or whatever energy level um, element, then you have, you know, you have your, in this case, 3S, um, electrons, you have your 3p electrons, and then you have this absolutely empty 3d sublevel. And, you know, it still exists, even though we haven't put anything in it, uh, you can still use this to store excess electrons. And that's what that looks like. So sulfur can do this little special thing. Each of these bonds um, represents two electrons, they're a shared pair of electrons. So in this case, sulfur has two, four, six, eight, 10, 12 electrons. So four more than the octet that it should be able to, but that's okay, sulfur can do that. And here, phosphorus has two, four, six, eight, ten. 10. If you notice the elements on the outside, they all just have your normal octet. And that's the case with most elements, outer elements, is that they are going to stick to that octet rule. It's these center guys that can be the exception if they want to be. And I think that's as far as I wanted to get on these notes. So to pick up the notes for the Lewis structures, just uh, watch the next video.